Uh, so, hello and welcome to Function Contracts in Practice. My name is Rostislav Klebnikov, or for short, it's Slava. I'm a team lead in Bloomberg's BDE Solutions team, and we develop uh, fun foundational libraries for C++. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about function contracts, why they are important, what it is, why they are important, and why you might want to choose uh, when you're developing your function, a function that has preconditions or, uh, in other words, so-called narrow contract. Um, then I'll, I'm going to be talking about how do you design a good contract, what are the aspects of a good contract for your function. Uh, and then once you implemented and designed your function, uh, I'm going to touch upon how to make sure uh, that the contracts are not violated by your clients, uh, how to communicate your contract to clients, because communication, programming is just, a, in programming, communication is just as important as just technical ability. And finally, uh, what is required of a contract checking system at scale uh, when you're working uh, on a and not just on toy program, but when you want to integrate like contract checking in your organization and the overall workflow. All right, so before I start talking about what is a function contract, let's take a look at what is just a contract in the real world. A contract is an agreement between two parties that creates obligation to perform or not perform particular duty. That's one definition. A contract is an agreement either written or spoken between two or more parties that creates a legal obligation. A contract is an agreement between parties creating mutual obligations that are enforceable by law. So you might note that all those definitions, even though they are slightly different, there are at least uh, a common thread between them. That is, there are at least two parties that are uh, communicating or interacting, and there are mutual obligations between the two of them. Um, I just pulled a, a contract that I had with my contractor that was repairing my, my house. Uh, don't, you don't need to read this, but again, on the, on the left side, there is an obligation. One, one party is the, the contract performing the work. They tell what their obligations are. And on the right are my responsibilities uh, and uh, what I need to do to make sure that the contractor does the job, as in, I have to pay. Um, all right, so what, what do contracts, those contracts, have to do with software? So first of all, there are two parties. One party is the function author. The other party is the client code that is calling the function. Uh, now, for the obligations, the author of the function promises to perform a particular task. But the client, on the other hand, is required to respect the, any constraints on the inputs, if there are some. Are they enforceable by law? Uh, well, not really, hopefully not, uh, but we'll talk about enforcement a little bit later. Oh my God, that, that is cut off. Hopefully it's not gonna become a big problem later on. All right, before I continue, I want to give a little disclaimer. First, all my examples will be in C++. I am a C++ developer through and through. I've been working with C++ for over 15 years. Uh, but it's important to note that uh, a lot of ideas, most of ideas that I'm going to be talking about, are applicable to pretty much any programming language. It's, it's not specific to C++. And the code that I will be uh, showing on the slides, hopefully not too cut off, um, will be inspired by uh, basically the decades of using uh, contracts uh, in Bloomberg um, that started way before I joined. Uh, the C++ 20 contracts, in quotes, because they never happened, but there was a lot of good work done there. And the current work uh, towards C++ 26 contracts in the study group 21 uh, in the ISO process. All right, so what are the elements of a function contract? First of all, preconditions. Basically, the constraints that the caller of the function must satisfy to call the function correctly. Those, um, those constraints might be on the input arguments, just the, the things that you pass, or program state, just any global state. Might be, you might have some requirements of those. And if it's a member function, uh, it might also have constraints on the object state. Uh, if those constraints 
are not satisfied, we say that the behavior of that function is undefined. Uh, then there is essential behavior, basically what the function author promises to do when you actually call the function in contract. It includes things like post conditions, um, the return values, changes in the, again, program or object state, and some extra things like behavioral guarantees uh, that might be algorithmic complexity, thread safety, and so on. You might ask, like, why do we need preconditions at all? Like, why don't we have every function handle every possible input? Well, some functions are actually like that, and some functions are so-called, they have naturally wide contracts, and you know many of them. For example, classic examples are like vector pushback. You can always push, try to push elements into the vector, and there are no preconditions on that function. Uh, you can ask vector its size. Again, you don't need to satisfy any preconditions uh, to call these functions. But other functions are not quite that easy. Uh, so again, sticking with the vector. Front, you want to get the first element of the vector. What if the vector is empty? Same for indexing. You want to get an element of the vector. Well, the vector has a size. What if you index outside the range? Uh, and even more um, complex preconditions exist in the standard library. Like you have a sort function, right? You, have, you, you give it a range and you give it a comparator. And the comparator needs to be special as like, um, it, it needs to impose a strict weak ordering on the elements of the range. So there are several reasons to have preconditions and not just say we will, we will try and handle every single possible input. Because defining behavior for all inputs might not only be inefficient, it might be like literally impossible. And furthermore, if we carefully define and correctly define our preconditions, uh, our programs will become more reliable, despite like, it might be counterintuitive, but it's true. Uh, they will become more maintainable and they will become more um, extensible. So let's look at those things one by one So I, uh, in, in more detail. So feasibility, uh, as I mentioned, de trying to define behavior for all possible inputs to your function might be uh, really impossible no matter how hard you try. So for example, if you have a, for example, constructor for a string view, um, you give it a pointer and size and, you know, the, its precondition is that the, this defines a valid range. But what if you decided, hey, I want to define behavior for that. I don't want to have any undefined behavior. How are you going to check that? Similarly, back to the sort example, the precondition uh, must impose a strict weak ordering. Well, even if you try to define behavior for the, the comparator that is bad, you might want to try, you'll, you'll compare all the elements in the range one by one and see that all the expectations of a strict weak ordering are there. Great, you can do that. The problem is, we, C++ doesn't require that this is a pure function. So it can change behavior between calls. And there is no way to, for you to check that, really. It's like, you know, those Volkswagens, the diesel gate, when on test bed they behaved perfectly, and then they decide uh, on the road, it's all pollution, pollution, pollution. Similar, the comparator might behave nicely for you to check precondition and then decide, you know what, I don't want a strict weak order. And another example, locking the mutex. Like currently the precondition is that the, the lock must not be owned by the current thread. There you can check it. You can do like a try lock maybe, but when the try lock returns, uh, you're, you're basically back in the same situation if it failed. All right, efficiency. Again, defining the behavior for all inputs might be possible, but very expensive. For example, we have the function that merges two ranges, and its complexity is linear. Uh, it has a precondition that both ranges must be sorted with respect to operator less. That is also linear but you're basically doubling what you're doing. If you say, 
you know, if you give me two ranges that are not sorted, I'm going to return an error. So you'll, be, you'll check first, and then you do the merge, and you're basically doubling what you're doing. It might be even worse. The lower bound, or binary search, whatever you choose, uh, it requires that the range must be partitioned with the respect to operator less uh, and this value that you're looking for. And to check, again, to define, if you try to define the behavior when it's not true, you would have to check if whether the range is partitioned. That is an operation that is linear. And we really want that function to be logarithmic in complexity. And more important than that, the performance penalty that you impose will be present on every single call to the function. Even if the person really knows what they're doing, they sorted the range right before calling lower bound, they will still have to pay the performance penalty. Now for reliability. Uh, you, if you try to quote unquote handle inputs that make no sense for your function, that actually typically leads to masking defects. So if somebody calls you uh, with really uh, <laughs> nonsensical inputs uh, and you continue working, you don't inform your caller, and then the, it's a bug and it just propagates and propagates and propagates. So let's take a look at some hypothetical, very bad examples. How about if popback does nothing if the vector is empty? Maybe. Hmm? But how about indexing operator on the string view, for example? Why don't we clamp the index to the size? That seems a little more dangerous. How about even further? If, what if the operator, the reference operator on an optional, if the optional is empty, returns you a static default constructed Val a reference to a static default constructed element. You require that the thing is the default constructible now. You all have all the thread safety problems that you have with static objects. And it's just kind of crazy, really. All right. So if, if you have a function that you define behavior for nonsensical inputs, they, they have a bug. Uh, you know, their behavior, like the program might work in some situations, um, and it gives people a false sense of security because they have a bug, but they don't see it and seem, the things seem to work. And it might manifest as an error or a crash at a code location very far away from the call site and probably at the worst possible time. And like, you know, uh, your client is like you showcasing Microsoft Windows 95, was it? and then it crashes right when you are presenting it to the world. Uh, or you lose millions of dollars just doing a wrong trade. Uh, maintainability. Again, handling nonsense input complicates implementation. Um, if you have more, you will have more error paths. So not only you as an implementer of the function will have to do more work, your clients potentially need to handle more error conditions, so their code becomes more com complicated. So let's look at a simple example. Like we have a function called min, min double, you give it uh, the range, just a couple pointers, and this is what we want to write. We basically want to write a single loop and nothing else. But obviously this, this thing would have some nonsensical inputs. So we decide, you know what, we don't, won't have preconditions, we're just gonna try to handle everything. Then, and throw an error. All right, this is a subset of things that we can check. Note that we cannot really check everything, but we try. And then we say, oh, you know what, uh, maybe there is also an and in, uh, in my array. I don't want that, so I'm gonna throw a domain error if I found an and. And also, for, for good measure, at the end, I'm going to also check if my uh, verify that I wrote the thing correctly. So I'm going to throw a, a logic error if something went wrong. So you see how the size of the functions uh, has massively increased. And on the caller side, you would also potentially have to handle the exceptions. So it's, it's a lot less maintainable than the small function that we had before. And finally, extensibility. Uh, if we defined all the behavior, 
we cannot easily change it. It basically will break ev every client that re re relies on that defined behavior. Uh, but if we had the, the behavior undefined before, uh, nobody is supposed to rely on that. Of course, I have to quote Hiram's law, but... <laughs> But any correct clients that do not violate our contract and do not invoke undefined behavior, uh, we can change that to something defined um, without breaking any existing clients. For example, like if we had our own implementation of a vector and we have the reference operator and like with standard vector, we had this behavior undefined if the index is out of range. But we could change that if we wanted to do so to just abort. This is a def defined behavior. No existing program would actually break. So we changed the behavior, we extended the behavior of our, of our function without any problem. So what is a good contract? Well, first of all, we need to decide what is the order of operations. We have several things that we need to do. We need to implement the function, we need to have the signature, and we need to write the contract. Is this the right order? Well, I don't think I've ever met a person who does the implementation before the signature, so this is clearly crazy. How about this order? First we start with a signature, then implementation, then a contract. Seems more reasonable, but how would you actually write the implementation of something that you didn't think through what it's supposed to do? So it's also not, <laughs> not the right way of doing things. How about this? Signature contract implementation. Again, it's, it's much, much better. Uh, but realistically, to understand what arguments your, your function needs to take, what it returns, um, you better come up with a contract first. So ideally, this would be your order. Well, to be fair, the contract and signature, you can co-evolve them uh, at the same time. Uh, but realistically, you, you need to think through about, think about what you're doing before you do it. All right. So what are the aspects of a good contract? Um, as we know, in software development, you want to keep things simple, focused. Um, so for, for a function contract, you want to define a minimal contract. So if the, the contract with the most preconditions, but the one that is complete for your functionality. So it needs to do the job that it needs to do, but it doesn't need to do anything else. Such a function will be suitable for a wide variety of clients and without imposing an unnecessary penalty, like, you know, the sort, uh, the, the lower bound, if it has a precondition that the range is sorted or partitioned, you will not impose a penalty on somebody who actually just sorted the, the, the range. And as we uh, talked about, they, some, some contracts are naturally wide. They're very simple. Back to pushback, back to size. Another interesting uh, case is mutex lock. So there is a um, operating system typically imposes the, uh, the limit on the number of levels of ownership of a recursive lock. So what if the uh, that that level is exceeded. What do you do? Do you th is it a precondition? Well, it's this is a more a, a more difficult question because this is the resource that's not necessarily a misuse of your function. So uh, and the the caller doesn't necessarily have control over the the system limit. So in this case, it would probably. Uh, be very similar to failure to allocate memory. And what does pushback do on failure to allocate memory? It throws bad alloc. Uh, it's, very, it's, a, it's an exception, but it's defined behavior on which you can rely. Uh, so it, don't be hostile to your clients. In this case, keep the contract wide. And the standard library actually does that. It throws system error. So we want to define, define narrow contracts. Um, but we don't want to them to be too narrow. So for example, if we look at string view remove prefix function, uh, we say move the beginning of this view by the specified count characters. Should this handle zero? Like why would somebody, you might think, why would somebody need to 
uh, move, uh, remove pre prefix of, uh, you know, count zero. Uh, but actually, we should handle that. And similar for the when we remove the prefix of the entire uh, stream view. So the, one of the reasons is your implementation will actually be simpler if you, are, if you handle these cases. It's the same implementation, and there's no reason to limit your clients in what the, they can call this with. But if they call with, with count larger than size, that is typically a bug. For example, it might come from some arithmetic. They, they want to, they did some calculations, but swap the order, uh, order of arguments for a sub subtraction. They got a massive value in the remove prefix since a size type is unsigned. And that is a bad idea. So you want to leave that behavior undefined. We want to support a wide variety of clients. Uh, and one, one way to do that, when you define your function with a narrow contract, is to provide additional facil facilities. So for example, if we have a, uh, like class HTTP header, uh, and we're using it in our HTTP2 library, uh, which does a, also allows HTTP communication, and HTTP2 places pretty complex constraints on the header fields. So should we return a status or, or indicate to indicate problems in name value? Well, no, we don't want to place that burden on people who really know what they are, what the, the, what they are calling this function with. But, because uh, we would have to check always you know, potential errors and all the things that I've um, talked about before. But instead, what we can do is to provide wide contract facilities complementing this one. So for example, we, we probably want to provide a function to check whether the name value pair is, uh, is a valid uh, header field. And uh, we want to provide a parallel facility that, like, for example, add field if valid, which will, um, as you notice, it will return an error code. So uh, in, essentially what it will do is call our checking function, and then if it's, it's a valid one, it call the add field with an error contract. Otherwise, it will return an error. All right, so we defined our function contract. We have some preconditions, but people are not malicious, but people are fallible. Bugs happen. Everyone writes a bug from time to time. So what do we do when the contract is violated? Well, per our contract, behavior is undefined. We can do whatever we want. We can do whatever we want within the cap capabilities of our program. Well, should we call law enforcement, place a call? Well, sue for damages. Well, I mean, we're working with our clients towards better software, towards a common goal. So we actually want to help them find the bug, understand the problem, and fix it. So what are our options? What can we do to help them out? So again, going back to our add field method, we say behavior is undefined unless it's valid name value. All right, so if somebody calls us out of contract providing bad name and value, we could do nothing. That's not very helpful. It probably, in this case, it probably won't even go into language UB, uh, but it, the error will appear very far along the way when the, this header is sent to the remote and the remote says, yeah, no, no, I'm not accepting it, it's malformed. And finding the problem, trying to trace it back to the root is gonna take a long time. Uh, so we probably want to check whether the precondition is violated, but what do we do next? We can try and fix incorrect characters. But again, we will be masking defects. The, the, our client will not know that they're doing something wrong. Should we throw an exception? Potentially, um, it might be useful. Could, maybe we just want to print the message in the log, and then go on as we did before. Maybe we want to abort the program to immediately alert the, our users about the problem. How about both? Maybe print and abort? Well, before we go into what, what is the option that is optimal, let's 
remind ourselves, is checking mandat mandatory? Like, do we have to check? Do we always have to always check? Do we have to check everything? Well, I hope you know, remember that we cannot check everything and we actually don't have to check always because the behavior is undefined. So we could use, for example, our good old friend C assert. Uh, so this is our function and we say, okay, in the beginning we assert that the name value pair is valid. So what does it, um, what does it get us? Well, in a checked build, when ndebug is not defined, we, a bug that, uh, the, that, that out of contract call will result in, uh, in the detection, it will basically print a message and abort. And it will be detected early and often, very often close to the source of the problem. So this is like an example of the output that assert will print for you. In an unchecked build, when ndebug is defined, we get a more efficient program because the check will be completely elided. It's not going to be, it's going to be pre-processor pre pre will just remove it. And you might ask, well, you talk about undefined behavior. So contract violation results in undefined behavior. Isn't it like, isn't the compiler capable of doing pretty much anything uh, that the, we would be able to do with the program? So, like, optimize things out? Well, not really. The, the reason is, when a contract is violated, we probably, most of the time, we didn't reach the uh, language UB yet, or hard UB, or just UB. Uh, instead, we have so-called library undefined behavior, because, uh, yeah, we just violated the contract, but um, it's, we're not in the hard UB land yet. And um, in, it's also sometimes called soft UB. So, for example, if we have like our uh, strlen function, very straightforward, and when, if somebody like passed us something like a null pointer, uh, we have the li library undefined behavior upon entering the function. But we don't reach the actual language undefined behavior until we try to dereference that pointer. So, um, contract checking. So contract checks are redundant, and I, I want to stress it, it's redundant code aiming to detect misuse by the caller of the function. And um, because it's redundant, removing some or all of the checks from a program that is correct, as much as it can be, should not affect its essential behavior. Uh, if we violate that, that idea, that removing the contract shouldn't affect this essential behavior, we might have some problems and I just want to highlight a couple of them. So imagine we have uh, some function and we say the behavior is undefined if inserting a value into like set of integers fails. Is this a good way to check it? Well, no. This is a much better option. Because again, remember that in an unchecked build, the assertion will be completely removed, so we will not insert anything. So we really need to make sure that essential side effects are not present in the predicates. There's, here's another example. It's a little more sneaky. Imagine we have a class that has, contains a map, and we have a function called insert value, and we say the behavior is undefined if the value at index has been previously corrupted. That is like encrypted store, you can put something in, corrupt it later, so nobody can put it in again. And that, good check. That's not a good check. That is because the indexing operator on the map will insert an element if it doesn't exist yet. So we, if we remove this line in an unchecked build, the behavior will change. All right. But are all side effects bad? Well, let's take a look at this example. So we have our HTTP header thing, um, and we have a function that's called contains, and it, is, it logs. We decided that we need to log something in there. Uh, then it basically does the lookup and check if the element is present. Um, is there a side effect there, by the way? Well, what was that? Yeah, but in this particular line. Well, temporary allocation, potentially. 
that might or might not be an important side effect for you. All right, and then we have the add field, and we require that the field has not been already inserted. And is it a good check? Well, all right, <laughs> now it's cut off. It sometimes might be okay. It depends on your application. It depends on your context. Like if you're, all, all your um, program is intended to do is print into a log, adding or removing a, a, a logging statement from your program might be uh, changing your essential behavior. But if you're in business of just communicating over the internet, and logging is for just that, logging, uh, if the presence or absence of a particular logging statement probably doesn't matter. So it might be okay. Also, it's important not to use contract checks for control flow. This is a slightly contrived example, I, I gotta say, but I wanted to highlight that. So imagine we have a function that should return a half a value or a null optional, uh, and it returns a null optional if you try to index outside of range, and it has a precondition that whichever element you're taking the half of should be even. So we are smart. We know that if there is a call function at in the vector that throws exception when you try to um, when you try to access it out of range, and we decide, hey, we will use that function and also ch check the precondition at the same time. All right, then we return half of the value or otherwise null opt. But it's also a bad idea. Again, if you build uh, and you make an unchecked build, you will lose that uh, check and you will have big problems. All right, also it's important not to confuse contract checks with input validation. By input, I mean uh, the di data tip coming from untrusted sources. Like it could be user input via UI or command line, data from a file that you just opened and read, or data received over the wire from the remote. And if you try to use contract checks for to assert basically that the data that you read from a wire is, ex is what you expect, you will have a bad time when you build an unchecked build because then you will not be performing any checks on the external data, which is a bad idea. And it's a deep topic and below there, there is a line saying, you see my uh, CppCon 2019 talk, I go in much, much more detail about input validation and, you know, it's, it's not quite as easy. All right. Um, it's important to understand that contract checking doesn't replace unit testing. Actually, they go hand in hand. They help each other. Uh, the contract check that you have in, in your code when you run your test driver, uh, when you run your test, uh, if you get a, a contract violation, the assertion will notify you, again, exactly where the problem happened. Um, also, unit tests, in essence, they actually, the machines to verify post conditions. You give the, your functionality some inputs, and then you check that you got the correct outputs and correct behavior. Um, also, I, I'm, I will not be talking about invariance, but I thought it would be interesting to mention that Actually, you can assert your invariance in the destructor, and if you have a very thorough test driver that puts um, your object into like every possible state, then and then destroys it, you can assert that your 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 member functions maintain the invariance. All right, so let's sum let's summarize. When creating a function, start with defining its contract. The contract should be minimal but complete. Uh, leave the behavior undefined. Don't be, don't be afraid to have preconditions. It's a good thing. And having those preconditions will make your code oftentimes faster, simpler, more maintainable, more extensible. Um, and then when you ha have your contract defined, make, try to check the preconditions. Those you can, you want to help your clients uh, catch the problems early and precisely. And Try to not misuse contract checks. Well, really, don't. Uh, so don't put essential side effects in them. Uh, do not use uh, contract checks as control flow mechanism. Don't use it for input validation. 
And remember, the contract checks do not replace but complement unit testing. All right. So now that we have our contract, how will our clients know what to do? Well, documenting your contract is important. You might ask, why not just self-documenting like self code? It's great. Well, it's not, it doesn't work often. So quaternion is a very useful uh, mathematical structure for representing orientations in 3D space. They're really great, like if you have a camera that you need to interpolate over the spline, this is literally the best way. If you try to do that with matrices, it's going to be a lot more painful. So you know, like you were a developer who just learned about quaternions and that they're great, you need to use it, and you come by this function. So you know that quaternion uh, defines uh, orientation and an angle, like a rotation around that angle. So you see x, y, z, that's probably the direction. W, it's probably angle, right? Well, the thing is, it's not. This is like, this comes from like stack overflow question that somebody asked a long time ago and I responded. And they made exactly this mistake. This is, uh, these are the coordinates of uh, quaternion and they, you need to convert from the axis angle representation. All right. Also, documenting the, your contracts, again, like if you follow the process, you, you should start with the contract. And if you already thought about it, write it down. You get the documentation for free. And another problem with uh, quote unquote self-documenting code, any behavior that you have inside there will become essential because you didn't say otherwise. I mean, there's still Hiram's law, right? Even if you promise something in the contract, people, you know, given long enough time will depend on it. But at least you have a path to, you know, uh, confront them saying, hey, guys, I told you the behavior is undefined. And at least they will feel bad, which is already a win. And again, like, if you have preconditions, uh, if you don't document them and you cannot check them, then how will the client know? All right, so basic, some basic guidelines. We need to document all the aspects of the contract, and we'll, I'll talk about what those are a little later. Uh, specific style doesn't really matter. So the style is up to you, but consistency is very important. It helps the, the clients of your library, for example, tremendously. All right, I'm going to give you another disclaimer before I go on. In the examples that follow, I will use the style that is used in my team, the BDE team in Bloomberg. And I'll make a direct comparison with uh, basically the Oxygen style uh, towards the end of the section. Uh, so, but again, remember, style is your choice as long as you document everything, every, every aspect of the contract. So uh, aspects of the contract that how we lay them out in our documentation style. What the function does, that's the first. What it returns, any uh, more essential behavior, so it's like some essential things that not necessarily pertain to the main purpose of the function. Then we describe the preconditions. And then we might add some additional not useful notes for the, for the uh, reader. All right, so what the function does, um, a sing we do a single imperative sentence describing the primary actions the function performs. And there is a, like, I didn't really, um, okay, never mind. <laughs> One of the best uh, outcomes from this is that if you have a trouble fitting the primary action of your function in a single sentence, you probably, the Probably the function does too much. You probably need to clarify the, the purpose, maybe split it up. Uh, so it's it's very useful design um, tool. And then you also, in the same sentence, you call out all arguments by name uh, and explain how they used or modified by the function. And again, it's again very useful uh, because if you your your sentence flow breaks, 
you can see that, oh, the, probably the argument name is not very descriptive. And then you change the name and, uh, you know, restore the sentence flow. And it's most of the time, when I personally had to do that, it does improve the, fun, uh, the argument naming. So let's take a look at the example. We have our string arrays with two iterators. Primary purpose of the function, arrays from the string a substring defined by the specified pair of first and last iterators within the string. Done. Well, the function returns. Again, a single imperative sentence describing the return value of the function. Uh, same reasons, if you have trouble formulating it in a single sentence, you probably have some design problem. For our race, we say, return an iterator, iterator providing modifiable access to the character at the last position prior to erasing, or end if no such character exists. I mean, obviously, if your function returns void, you don't need to write return nothing. It's obvious. Uh, and sometimes it's, uh, for simple functions, it's easy to combine. It, it makes sense to combine the return part with what the function does, because all the function does is return a value. So for example, starts with, returns true if this view starts with a subview and false otherwise. Other essential behavior. So we might have some collateral effects and other consequences essential to the functionality. So for example, for erase, our good friend erase here, we say that this method invalidates existing iterators pointing to first or a subsequent position. This is a, a part of the essential behavior of the arrays function. It could include things like thread safety, uh, complexity guarantees, iterator stability guarantees, things like um, exceptions, like strong exception safety guarantees and such. There's a lot of things that can come here. Now for the preconditions. We introduce our preconditions with the phrase, behavior is undefined unless, except when it would lead to a double negative, because nobody likes a double negative. So why do we use the unless form? Um, all right, that's OK. Let's like, take a look at the example. So in our case for arrays, the behavior is undefined unless first and last are both within range and first less than equal last. So. Uh, What's the benefits of unless, of an unless form? So it's, first, it allows us to use the same expression in documentation and in our contract check. So for example, our uh, simple square root function says behavior is undefined unless uh, value is non-negative, and then we assert the same exactly with the same spelling uh, in, in the function body. But that's not all. Uh, Multiple preconditions that are phrased with unless are additive. So you can have multiple, just write multiple assertions, and you don't need to, oh, here's, I wrote if, and then um, if A or B, and then I need to check the negative, so I need to change that or to and. So you don't, uh, you don't have that trouble when you're, it's not really trouble, but it, you don't need to make your life more difficult than it, it needs to be. So. Uh, for example, if we have a function on a square that sends two dimensions and we say behavior is undefined unless width is non-negative and height is non-negative, and then we just write two asserts one after another. Very straightforward. Um, there's, it, it is also pretty useful to have a, a consistent order of your preconditions. Now, here's what I mean by that. For example, if we have a member function func that takes three arguments, on a particular object. First, uh, we describe the preconditions on the, that do not depend on any inputs, or on the, any of the arguments. The preconditions on the state of the object or global state. Then we define the uh, describe the preconditions on individual arguments, and then on their relationships. Just having this consistently laid out really helps out uh, the reader. And additional notes. Additional notes could be like any supplementary information potentially useful to, to the client of the function. And it's typically basically aspects of behavior that you can derive from the contract as is, but they're not necessarily obvious. So for example, if we have our data function on a string, we can say note that any call to string destructor of any its manipulators invalidates the return pointer. If you read the whole documentation on string, you can kind of figure it out, but it's useful to remind people that are reading the contract. 
similarly a conversion operator to basic string view. Now note that this conversion operator can be invoked implicitly, for example, during argument passing. You can look at the signature, you can see that it's not explicit, you can kind of figure it out, but this highlights uh, what this conversion operator is for and why it's uh, implicit, actually. So why did we choose this style? It's actually quite concise, and its rigid structure allows us to spot issues while, when we are writing that documentation. It's human-oriented, not tool-oriented. Uh, but there's a variety of different styles out there. You, like probably the most popular one is Doxygen, but you also have QDoc and et cetera, et cetera. So let's take a look how they compare. I'll start with a really exaggerated example, but it's interesting nonetheless. This is an example of what some might write in Doxygen style. It's a function that adds two values. We have a brief description, the extended description, and description of every single parameter. But there's so much, so many words that don't really say anything. It's just polluting the, the whole, uh, you know, it takes nine lines, eight lines of documentation for such a simple function. With our style, we just say return the sum of the specified x and y. Done. In one short sentence, you know what this function is doing. And also, if we follow our you know, guide, guidelines on how to write documentation, you might notice that you probably need to mention that this function has preconditions. Or depending on how you want to implement it, you might say, you know, the essential behavior it will throw if uh, we result in integer overflow. Now, but artificial examples are great, uh, but let's look at, a, at the real one. I took this example from Juice Framework. Um, Juice Framework is excellently engineered, Excellently documented, which is kind of highlighted by 5,000 stars and 1,500 forks. Um, and the goal of the example, that well, there's only one example uh, that follows, um, is not to kind of throw shade on the oxygen style or juice. It's just to provide a fair comparison. Um, and I chose like one component at random, zip file in this case, it had a lot of large code blocks and I think it would provide a good basis for comparison. So let's take a look. All right, so this is a member function of zip file, it's called add entry, and it says add stream to the list of items which will be added to archive. We have a parameter stream to read with a lot of information um, and it says that it must not be null. We have compression level, we say it can be between zero and nine. We have stored path name, the partial path name that will be stored in the file, and file modification time, the timestamp that will be stored in the uh, the last modification time on this entry. So he, I tried to kind of come up with our how we would document that. And this is how it looks like. So you notice it's actually shorter. Uh, so, I say add the specified stream to the list of items that will be added to the archive, compressed at the specified compression level, and stored with a specified partial path name and file modification time. Notice that I actually renamed one of the arguments. It's, it used to be called stored path name and file modification time, but I, like both of them are stored. If you, to, if you see that the, both of them are stored, so why, why, why is one of them called stored path name and the other one is not like just file modification time? So I just renamed it to uh, partial path name, which is actually a more precise um, description of what it is, and the file modification time. Then we say, actually, the, the interesting thing is that the compression level in, the, in this documentation, it says it can be between zero and nine. What does it mean? What happens if it's out of that range? Do we clamp it? Do we have undefined behavior? I don't know. Um, so here I kind of surmise that it's probably undefined behavior, and I, but here I'm, I'm very uh, specific about it. Behavior is undefined unless compression level is in that range, or if the stream is null. And then I kind of repeat the long description of the details of the stream. Um, and you see that I'm, I'm using that in note that part. So it's, it can be, uh, you know, if you look at the whole component and you analyze, you kind of can understand that that, is, that will be the behavior, but it's very useful for the reader of this particular function to call this out. 
Um, all right, so also there is like, um, while I was writing it, I was thinking, there are probably some constraints on partial path name, but I have no idea what they are. So again, this style, for me personally at least, uh, just brings out problems uh, that needs, like the, the documentation is lacking. All right, so document your contracts, please. Uh, specific style is not important, really, but choose one and follow it. And make sure it includes all aspects of the contract and be consistent. All right, so. Assert is not enough. Always reminds me of that James Bond, the world is not enough tune, but <laughs> um, contract checking at scale. So hopefully I convinced you that contract checking, like programming with narrow contracts, describing the contracts, and contract checking is a good idea. And if you try to apply just using the regular assert at scale, you're probably gonna uh, have a tough time. Uh, because the behavior of a cert, you know, like it, you cannot configure it. It will do what it will do. All checks are treated the, res the same, irrespective of their complexity. Um, adding checks to old code with a cert is very, very, very hard. I'll, I'll go in and testing those assert statements is also very hard. So I'm going to go into detail uh, about every problem. So problem one, a cert behavior is not configurable. It just prints to std error and aborts. And you as an application owner, especially a large application owner, might want completely something different. Maybe you just want to log to a different destination, different format. Maybe you want to throw an exception. Maybe spin, spin in loop and yield, just waiting to, for the debug, debugger to be attached. Maybe something else. You could potentially install a SIG abort handler, but it's very limited in what it can do. Um, it has no information about the contract violation, uh, and it cannot really discriminate between assert and other sources. Um, all right, so how do we solve that? Well, we probably need to implement our own contract checking system. And the CCS, that's exactly what it stands for. So we define, okay, we will have a violation handler and we'll have a function that sets the violation handler and that function is called whenever we detect a contract violation and give uh, the, the handler the information about the problem, where it happened and what condition was uh, violated. It makes sense to provide several off-the-shelf handlers so not everybody who's using your contract checking system has to roll their own. They, by default, it makes sense to just abort. Um, it, it's probably the most helpful one, uh, but it's not always applicable. We can also provide fail by sleep, which is just this sleep in the loop waiting for debugger. There's a stood breakpoint, uh, I believe. It, it was I accepted in 23, that also might be, a, no, not yet? Ho okay, hopefully in 26, you could have that as your contract violation handler. Um, and we can also fail by throw, but I will touch uh, more on that when we're talking about testing. Uh, should the violation handler be allowed to continue? In many application contexts, it's actually a bad idea. Because the program, like the contract was violated, the program is broken, uh, we're probably gonna hit language undefined behavior very soon. And if you're like working on a financial system that's doing trades, if you detect that, run, stop. Otherwise, you might like lose uh, millions and millions, and the other party will not care that you had a bug. Uh, but we do need uh, continuation in some circumstances, in some industries. For example, in games, undefined behavior, you know, frame didn't render correctly, the next one will be fine, maybe. So why, why stop your progress in the game? We'll discuss a bit more about that. For now, let's prevent continuation. And it's, we can do that very simply by defining, it still, it still has to be a macro because we want to stringify the condition. At least we can use source location. We invoke the handler if uh, the condition wasn't uh, satisfied and abort afterwards. By the way, when the, uh, in unchecked builds, 
Uh, we don't just remove the whole statement. Uh, we put it in an unevaluated context to make sure it still compiles so we can prevent some code rot. All right. I wanted to touch, like, with, the, with this violation handler that is customizable, one might be tempted to use it for control flow in a completely different way. And here is like a simple exa well, it's an example that like a function that takes a uh, string that is supposed to be a, a bunch of numbers, uh, then possibly a dot and a bunch of numbers. So like a whole part, uh, integer part, and fractional part of a value, for example, in JSON. So somebody might come in and say, you know what, I'm just going to use this uh, useful RAII guard that will set up my violation header to throw. This is exactly what I promised in my contract, to throw the main array. And then I'm just going to go happily and assert all the, all the statements that um, you know, show when to throw the, bad in the, the main error. Well, as you might imagine, an unchecked build, this will break hard. And it is a very bad idea. All right, so there, in addition to the assert, it makes sense to provide uh, additional utilities. For example, invoke handler, which allows uh, the user to invoke the handler directly. And it's sometimes useful to avoid computing the predicate multiple times. So for example, like if we have a function that takes an enum as an input, and the enum has two particular enumerators, we could write assert. We want to make sure that we are we're not given some random integer and then do a switch. But with invoke handler, we can avoid double checking and just add a default and invoke the handler there. And it's better than assert false, because assert false sometimes will give you a warning. And you don't want warning for no reason. Second problem. Some checks are too expensive. So application owners need to have the ability to balance performance impact of checking uh, versus the amount of checking. And library developers need a way to kind of give that control to the application owner. So we, the first approach that you might take, let's give a number to every statement uh, that shows how much relative work it does for checking to the useful work of the function. So for example, square root, pretty, pretty not, not very simple function. So this check is very, very simple. So let's give it a 3. 3%, 3 let's say. Well, cool. When we're negating a value, our precondition is that we're not at an int min. Pretty similar amount of work. Let's give it 100. How about our lower bound? 1,000? 100,000? Size times 100? Maybe times 3? I don't know. In, in practice, it's just too cumbersome. It's, it's, it's really difficult to control, to both write and control. So instead, uh, it's better to have very rough classification. First is just regular assert that says that checks that take less computation that, than the actual useful work, and the audit check that basically do more than the useful work. And this is a minimal useful set. Um, so you, you can have, like your enterprise might decide, oh, you know what, we actually need some super light checks that we really want to run pretty much almost always. Uh, but almost, this is important. Uh, and maybe we want to have a separate level for checks that break our algorithmic complexity. Um, that we really don't want that unless we are building like super heavily checked build. So there are some tricks as well, how you can use those two. So for example, our good friend lower bound, again, I'm going to use is sorted and not, not is partitioned because it's just slideware. But if we have a function lower bound and we just do our usual rounds, um, so how do we verify its preconditions? First, we can add an audit level check for is sorted. So in most builds, it, this check will not be active and will, and will not drag down our performance. But we want to have some checking in like default level builds as well. So what we can do is actually within the loop, check the two elements that we're looking at. 
So we're going to only uh, ensure that those elements that we look at are in order, but we will not uh, change the complexity. It's still log n algorithm. Now, next problem is that it's difficult to add or modify checks. And here's what I mean by that. So imagine you have like a trading system that's been running on thousands of machines for years, and it's proven to be very reliable, and it's absolutely awesome and working. But we want to add a contract check in the, into that system. Uh, contract checks, contract violations, we want to fix them. But how do we do that? If we just add an assert, we're going to have a big problem because it will bring down all, mach all machines. And we know that thing is working. Um, plus, we might add a wrong check. So we don't want to bring down all machines for that either. So, for example, um, this actually happened. Um, we had a, our own implementation of optional uh, with the dereference operator. It, the behavior is undefined if there is no value in an optional. But existing code actually dereferenced that for fundamental types and then kind of, you know, did nothing with that. So it's technically a contract violation, but things work. So... And similarly, if you have a, a audit level check and you want to make it a default level check, it's very, very similar situation. So how do we approach that? Um, <clears throat> what we want is a, um, a, a contract check that allows continuation after the, the, in, the handler has finished, even if it's returned normally. <clears throat> so what it looks like is basically a different macro called review. And it's exactly the same as the assert, but you see there's a board is commented out just, just for, for the slide, for visibility. And that's it. So when you handle review failure, um, if you put that into your working system, even a single incorrect use might be, you know, the, that, that code location might be hit millions of times. And if you log every single time, you're going to bring down like uh, your application to a crawl and it might be even better if you abort it because this, like, this is kind of chugging along, eating your energy and pretty much not doing any useful work. So to mitigate that, the violation handler needs to differentiate between uh, the violation happening in the cert and the violation happening from review. So you can do like exponential back off and log a lot more rarely. So what we do is we associate a semantic with each contract check. So it might be as simple as this. We have an ignore semantic. This will never actually be called. Um, the violation handler will not be called with this, but it's useful for completeness. The enforced semantics that we use for assert that basically aborts after the handler returns, and the observe semantic. Uh, basically, if a check fails, violation handler is called, but it doesn't abort uh, after the violation re uh, handler returns. And we need to mo modify our contract violation object uh, and give information to the violation handler by providing the semantic. So our macros change a little bit. We, for assert, we provide enforce to viola uh, violation handler. For review, we provide observe. And then we can write a exponential back off handler. I'm not going to go too much in detail. So we switch on the semantic. If it's enforced, we just log, and the, uh, the abort will be called from the outside. And the, uh, for observe, we just count the number of uh, violations. And then if it's basically a power of two, only then we log, and then we return. That's it. So we will log exponentially rare for a particular problem. Uh, actually, before I go, it's, it was interesting that this Thursday uh, on uh, study group 21 meeting, it see, the idea was floated that it might be better to rely, require that the violation handler itself aborts uh, if the, uh, the semantic is enforced and not the, this, the, uh, the contract checking system itself uh, enforcing that. And that is, you might be useful for, um, like if you have a third party library, a closed source third party library, and you, uh, for some reason, they compiled with uh, enforced contracts, 
if you if if it's everything on the violation handler, if the violation handler is the one that aborts, you can actually change it to observe for that library without really, you know recompiling the library. But you know it's work in progress. So the life cycle of a review. So we want to check uh, to add a new check to existing code or change the level of the existing check. We start by adding a review. We observe and fix any violations for sufficient amount of time, whatever it is for you, for your uh, application. For example, like three months. Uh, and once we fixed everything, we do not observe any new violations. We just change that to, from review to an assert, and then it becomes a proper assert and never changes ever again. Uh, all right, I'm going to skip that. Uh, so let's take a look at an example. That example with optional reference operator. Uh, we had an audit level assert. Uh, but we want to change that level to default, so it's checked more. So what we do first is we keep the audit level assert. We add the default level review, and just wait and fix issues. Once, hopefully, all the issues have been fixed, just replace that with regular assert. We're done. Uh, another useful um, case is like we have a production system uh, that's been running and everything is fine, but we decided that we want to run like a subset of servers with extra checks with more expensive ones, so we can say that um, we just treat the assert. We don't want those servers, if they detected the contract violation at audit level, to die, because we know everything works. So we basically treat the ass audit level asserts as audit level reviews and put it in production and you know, monitor the logs to, to detect to see if anything is violated. Uh, another example is narrowing a contract. And this is also a like, real thing that happened um, to us. So we had a concurrent cache that has like two watermarks, low and high. And the and, and initial contract was that if the low watermark is larger than the high watermark, we would use low watermark for both. And in reality, what it means is that this cache is not only not in improving our performance, it's just sitting there idle and just com com consuming resources for no reason. And it's typically a bug that people did not intend. So this is the original implementation. So how do we go, uh, go about narrowing that contract? First, add a review. As before, sit and wait, find all the places where it's violated, fix them. And then fix the contract, behavior is undefined now, fix the implementation, look how nice and small, and keep the assert, change the review to assert. All right, finally, contract checks, if you use a, a C assert, are very difficult to test. But they're cold. We are people. We make mistakes in asserts as well. So we have to unit test them. So what we need to do is a trigger the, the contract violation and make sure that, that our contract check actually caught the problem when it's, when it's enabled, obviously. How do we do that? So if we have a C assert or we have a, an aborting handler, it would require death tests. But it's not supported in many testing frameworks. It's significant performance penalty. It's difficult to discriminate, like once the program aborts, um, discriminate between assertion failure and other reason for abortion. Uh, so it's, very, it's not very uh, useful. Uh, in fact, it's also like, all, oftentimes it relies on forking the process, so it's kind of unsafe or not fork safe uh, code. So our approach is to use what we call a cert test. So we set up a throwing violation handler, we invoke the function under test out of contract, we catch the exception, exception came from the wrong place, bug in a contract check. Exception uh, caught when there should have been none, bug in a contract check. No exception caught when there would, should have been one, believe it or not, bug in a contract check. So, 
let's take a look at the exam an, an example. Imagine we have a function called bind on the socket object. It takes a null terminated string uh, and the port number. And we have preconditions that, you know, you shouldn't give us null, the address must be valid, and the port number should be uh, between 0 and 65535. So to do the test, we use another um, RAI object that basically sets up the violation handler to throw. Create a socket. And we have several macros that basically invoke something, catch the exception, check that the exception is exactly as expected. It came from the right place. It came at the right level. Um, so we do some, fa um, some negative tests, negative tests for uh, testing uh, violation uh, contract, check contract checks. And we do another test for the other assert. And finally, uh, with no pointer and it, below there, which you don't see, we also have uh, a pass check. So basically, we also want to make sure that when we give the uh, function correct arguments, it doesn't uh, make an incorrect um, contract check. All right. So you might ask, wouldn't no except get in the way of such testing? I can throw an exception. Well, yeah, it would. That's why we uh, in our company follow the Lakers rule. Uh, basically, the, in, the, in the most basic form, the idea is you don't, don't put no accept on narrow contract functions. And the motivation for that was in the original paper, like in 2000, before C11. Um, and the upcoming in May 15th, there is more motivation for that uh, in P2837 that is being written by my colleagues, well, Joshua Byrne and John Lakers. Um, so it's important that to understand that like currently, no except, it's it's like a completely separate, like a whole topic on in, in of itself, but no except is very overused in like current modern code. Uh, and interestingly enough, um, we have the book uh, called Embracing Modern C++ Safely. Um, and we have done so many benchmarks to figure out whether no accept actually helps performance. Just no accept on like, functions. And it turns out, no. Sometimes it does make the code size a bit smaller. But um, Realistically, the performance benefit only comes when that no accept is queried, queried by a no accept operator in some generic algorithm. This was the original purpose of no accept in the first place, to maintain strong exception safety guarantee on a vector in presence of move semantics. That's, that's where the, be, the, the main benefit is. But just sprinkling no accept on all your functions is actually a bad idea. And plus, it prevents you from testing your con uh, checking your contracts. Testing your contract checks. <laughs> All right. Um, again, uh, you could say, well, if you have a no accept, I will use death testing. We already discussed why death testing it might be problematic. You say, oh, okay, I'll set up my violation handler to do a long jump. But it's a bad idea if you like. It's undefined behavior if you jump anything non-trivial. So those tests will be flaky, probably. Um, the other idea that was to use no accept only in unchecked builds. Uh, but when testing, turn it off. You can still use exceptions for testing. Well, I'm going to leave you with this quote from Eric Fizelier. Um, for libc++. That is a commit from 2019. He's saying, Having thought more and having grown wiser, no accept debug was a horrible decision. It was viral, it didn't cover all the cases that needed to, and it was observable to the user. At worst, changing the behavior of their program. And there's a paper about that as well, also coming May 15th. All right, so to summarize, provide means to set the violation handler. Owner of main will thank you because they, they can uh, choose the handling strategy. 
Um, be careful with allow, allowing continuation, but remember it might be okay for your industry or in your particular case. Differentiate assertions by complexity. Have an, uh, at least an assert and assert audit. Interestingly enough, that's exactly what boost contracts have. Um, it lets your, the author of the function categorize easily, uh, and the owner of main can control the trade-off easily. Uh, provide mechanism to add new checks to old code, which is review, and down there, unit test your contract checks. All right. We're almost done. So, carefully define your contracts for your functions. You're gonna thank yourself, your clients will thank you. It's, it's, it's a very, very useful idea. Define them to be minimal, but complete. Have preconditions. Leave the behavior undefined for inputs that don't make any sense for your function. Defend against colon misuse by having contract checks. You're defending yourself, but you're also helping them to find the bugs. Choose a documentation style and follow it consistently. Make sure it uh, encompasses all the important aspects. And when deploying at scale, have a sufficiently flexible contract checking system. Configurable violation handler is very useful. Um, actually, the standardization seems to have consensus that violation link time replaceable violation handler is where we're going, but it's still again, work in progress. Um, have a parallel facility to introduce new checks to your program, like review mechanism. Have a few assertion levels uh, for ease of, well, we talked about that. And again, unit test your contract checks, and keep in mind not putting no except on functions, having narrow contracts. Thank you. Questions?